So today I'm going to walk you through, just like Siddarshana said, setting up the connection to the ZOS mainframe. And then we're gonna go through two different COBOL programs. Um, first and foremost, if you're following along at home, you need to have downloaded and installed the prerequisites. So that is Node.js, Java SDK, Visual Studio Code, and Zoe Explorer and IBM Z Open Editor extensions for Visual Studio Code. So when you open Visual Studio Code, it's gonna look something like this. And if you're not sure if you have the extensions installed, you can go right over here to the left side toolbar and you can click this extensions icon. And that's gonna show you which extensions you have enabled. And if you're missing one, you can just search it right here and you'll have a screen that pops up like this when you find it and it will say install right here. So if you don't have that, you can go ahead and do that right now, it's very quick. So next I'm gonna open up the Zoe Explorer, right down here, this Z in the diamond. And you'll see we get these three sections, data sets, Unix system services, and then jobs. We're gonna start at data sets and we're gonna create our profile that's going to establish the connection to ZOS. So you can go ahead and expand data sets. You'll notice that I have these favorites folders. I have them in each section. You may not have that. It's because I've created connections in the past. However, if you don't have it, it should pop up after you create your first connection. If not, it's okay. It's not important to what we're gonna be doing today. So to create the profile, you'll see once you expanded this data set section, you have these two symbols that pop up. You're gonna wanna click the plus sign to add a profile. And be careful here, it's a little misleading. It looks like you're supposed to type it in, but you don't wanna do that. You wanna actually click create a new connection to ZOS. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna click that. And then it's gonna prompt you for a connection name. So I'm going to name mine, Learn COBOL. You can name yours whatever you want, and then just hit enter. And next you're gonna be prompted for the ZOSMF URL that's going to establish the connection to ZOS. And this information was in the registration email that you received after you set up an account with the Open Mainframe project. So I would suggest just copying and pasting it so that um, you don't have any errors. So go ahead and hit enter after you type that URL in. And then it's gonna ask you for your username, which was also contained in that email. So I'm gonna go ahead and type mine in and you can go ahead and type yours in. And I'm gonna hit enter. And then again, the password was also in that email that you received. So type that in and hit enter. Be careful here not to just continuously press enter because the default selection is not what we want. We want to click false. We want to accept connections with self-signed certificates. So I'm gonna go ahead and click false. And you'll see I have my profile right here. Profile Learn COBOL was created. So now that I have this connection set up, I need to I need to filter out the data sets that are allocated to my specific ID and you will be doing it for your specific ID. So in order to do that, I'm gonna expand the Learn COBOL folder and I'm gonna hit this search icon right here. And you'll see I have a list here of filters that I've already used. That's because like I said, I've created previous connections, but I'm just going to pretend that those don't exist down there and I'm gonna do it as you would. And I'm gonna type in my ID and hit enter. And you give it a second. And you'll see a list of the data sets beginning with my ID have appeared here. So now that we've set up that connection, we're all set and ready to start on a program. But before I start with that, I just want to stop here and see if there are any questions that anybody had about the uh, setting up a connection process. Um, we're good for now, McKenzie. I think we can continue. Oh. Yeah. Great. So 
The two folders that we're going to be paying attention to is going to be this id.cbl folder, which contains all of the source code for all of the COBOL programs in the course. And then we have this id.jcl folder, which contains all the JCL code for each program in the course. So first I wanna look at the program that we're gonna run. So that's gonna be the payroll 00 program. We can click that and it's gonna open up. And I just wanna go through the contents of this program so we can kind of understand what it's supposed to produce as an output. And then we can go ahead and, and submit that job and view that output. So firstly, I want to talk about these seemingly random vertical lines throughout the program. So they're, not act, they're actually not random at all. They represent the differentiation of areas in COBOL. And these areas are really important because COBOL is a structured programming language and it must be written in reference format. And reference format consists of these different areas. So each of these vertical lines represent the beginning and ending column of each area. So this would be a column or an area, I'm sorry, and this and whatnot. Each area has specific rules that govern the content that can be written within that area. And if you're interested in learning more about that, you can ask questions at the end or you can go right to the course book and check out chapter four. So next, I wanna talk about the different divisions that the program is split up into. You can see right here, we have identification division, data division, and procedure division. Starting at identification division, this division contains the basic program identification information, like the name of the program, which you can see right here. It could also contain information like the author and stuff of that sort. The next section, the next division that we have, excuse me, is the data division. And the data division is where we define the data type of the data names used within the program. So you'll see we have these data names right here and then these data types right here that we've defined for each of them. The data name definitions have to be placed within a data division section. And the one present here is the working storage section you'll see right here. The, these different data division sections represent different characteristics of the data and storage for the program. So looking at the data types assigned to th these data names specifically in this program, the pick X here represents an alphanumeric data type, whereas the pick nine represents a numeric data type. And then the numbers you see within these parentheses those represent the length of that data name value. So next we have the procedure division. The procedure division contains the instructions for what the program should execute. It's where all of the work gets done in the program and it tells the program what to do with all of the information that we've previously defined. You can see here there are some move statements where it's taking strings and numbers and placing them into the data names that we have defined. And then we have a calculation statement right here using compute. And then we have some display statements. So this is what should what the output should contain. There is another division that's not present in this program, but is worth mentioning, and that's the environment division. And it's not present here because it's only required if the program will be reading from or writing to external data sources, which we're not doing here. So it's not required. So now that we've gone through that program and we sort of understand exactly what it's supposed to be doing, let's take a look at the corresponding JCL file. So I'm gonna close up the .cbl folder and I'm gonna expand my .jcl. So these JCL files, they contain the JCL code to run, to compile and execute the program, to run the program. So it, these are also the files that you would click to submit the job you wanna be careful not to accidentally submit the source code. It's not gonna produce any results for you. And I'll show you what that error message looks like really quickly. So if I go into my source code and I go to the program that I want to run and I right click it and I hit submit job, I'm gonna get this REST API failure right here. 
So if you are trying to submit a job and you get this kind of an error message, it's likely that you just accidentally submitted the source code instead of the JCL code. So we don't want that. So I'm gonna close that back up and I'm gonna go back to my JCL file and I'm going to right click and I'm going to submit the job. And you'll see down here in the bottom right, job submitted, job number 1714. Okay. So the job was submitted, but what now? There's no, there's no new files here. How do we know that it worked? How do we see the output? Where is everything? So we're actually gonna close up the data sets because we're done with that for now. And we're gonna expand the job section. And here we need to add the profile that holds the connection. So we're going to click add profile. And this time you'll notice that your connection is right here listed. So you can go ahead and click that. And now you'll see that folder present. And that folder contains all of the jobs associated with that connection. So the first thing I wanna take note of is the CC0000 right next to the job. And that represents the condition code of the job. And that means that the condition of the job that ran, so all zeros is a successful job run, and anything higher than that means that there was some sort of problem. So to view the output, we're gonna expand our job folder. We've got all these fun things in here. What we're gonna look at first is we're gonna look at the compiler output, this sysprint 101. So I'm gonna click that. And this is going to show up, if, if there were um, errors when the code was compiling, this is where we would know uh, what those errors are. This is where we would see that. It would have a message because we didn't have an error we can see that with the zeros there won't be one but you can scroll down and see that the source code is in this compiler output and if you go all the way to the bottom you'll see return code of zero which is just another confirmation that yes the program was compiled and executed and then to view the output we're going to go ahead and click payroll sys out that is the execution output and as you can see, it the program did exactly what we thought it would. And that is to show us the name of the, I guess, worker and then all of his payroll information. So now that we've gone through that, I wanna take a minute and see if there are any questions on that. Are we good, Sadarshna? Okay. Um, no, I think you try the next lab. Okay, sounds good. All right, so now that we've gone through what a successful job run will look like, I just wanna take you through what an unsuccessful job run would look like. So we can close up our jobs folder and go back to our data sets. And this time what we're gonna do is we're gonna submit the job for payroll 0x. So I'm going to right click that and I'm going to submit job and I'll get my confirmation down here, job submitted, 17, 18, okay. And then like I did previously, I'm gonna close that up just to avoid clutter on my screen. I'm gonna open up the jobs open up my profile and there is my second job right there the payroll 0x job 1718. the first thing that you can notice here is the condition code it's not four zeros so that means that we have some sort of error so let's figure out what that error was and how we can change it how we can fix it another thing you can notice here once you open it up is there's no um sys out there's no execution output. So that's just yet another indicator that something went wrong. So I'm gonna look at the compiler output. And what I'm gonna be looking for here is the IGY message. 
So I'm gonna scroll down until I find that. So here it is right here on line 107. And it's pointing us to line 21 in the source code, which is right above it. And it's telling us that that's where the error occurred. And what exactly was that error? Well, right here it tells us. It's telling us that the data name definition we gave gross pay cannot be used in this compute statement. So we gave it an alphanumeric data type right here and written right here in the source code. However, the compute statement needs it to be numeric or numeric edited. So we need to go back into the source code and we need to change this so that it reflects a numeric data type. So I'm gonna go back into my data sets and I'm gonna open up my source code, source code folder. I'm gonna open up my source code and I'm gonna find that line right here. And like we discussed previously in going over the first lab, we said the X represents alphanumeric, so we wanna change that to a nine to represent numeric. And you'll see the data set automatically saves, which is nice, so you don't have to worry about you know, file and saving that. And now to, to just verify that that was the proper correction we needed to make, let's resubmit the job and make sure that we get the output that we are expecting. So I'm gonna go back into my JCL files and I'm going to run that corresponding JCL file again. I'm gonna submit it. Job submitted, 1722. And then uh, you can notice here, it's not, it hasn't shown up yet. So if that's the case and you didn't close this up, you can just hit the refresh right here and that'll pull in your most recent job. So you can see job 1721, it's a 22, excuse me, it's the third one on the list. And we got a condition code of all zeros. So that's great, that means it worked. That means that we fixed the error. And furthermore, we can go to see the execution output and see that it's exactly what we expected to happen.